Great, I think we'll get started. We, um, we seem to have most people who have joined. Um, so good afternoon, everyone, and a warm welcome to all our viewers around the world. I'm Karen deutsch Karlaker, the Director of Free Expression at Risk Programs at PEN America, and I'll be facilitating our event. I wanted to start by wishing our Iranian audience a very happy Yalda winter solstice celebration today. We hope that this event and this film will play a small part to bring more light and mutual understanding into the world at a dark time for human rights in Iran. PEN America's inaugural Freedom to Write Index, which we released in May, found that Iran ranks in the top five countries globally in terms of individuals jailed for their expression. Dissident writers, creative artists, journalists, academics and thought leaders, and even ordinary citizens have been targeted with hundreds of political prisoners currently languishing behind bars. For the past four months, PEN America has been engaged in an intense advocacy campaign on behalf of one such emblematic prisoner of conscience, the human rights advocate Nazreen Sotudeh, whom we honored with our 2011 Freedom to Write Award. Together with Amir Sultani, a filmmaker and author of the graphic novel Zara's Paradise, we've been building an international groundswell of support to help win Nazreen's permanent release. As part of this effort, we're thrilled today to co-host this event with Ms. Magazine to mark the theatrical release of a new film entitled Nazreen, profiling her essential work and voice. We'll open the event now with a message from Margaret Atwood, a committed supporter of the Freedom to Write and Imprisoned Writers Everywhere. Hello, I'm Margaret Atwood. Last year, I presented Nazreen Suteda in absentia with Penn Canada's annual One Humanity Award. She has also been honored with the 2011 Penn America Freedom to Write Award and the 2020 Write Livelihood Award. I'm pleased to introduce today's conversation about this remarkable woman and the documentary about her life and work, Nazreen. A respected Iranian lawyer and human rights advocate, Nazreen Suteda has tirelessly defended women, children, and religious minorities from exactly the sort of arbitrary judicial rulings that are now being used to silence her. This beautiful and essential film shows Nazreen's incredible strength in the face of terrible adver adversity in an inspiring and surprisingly personal way. I hope you'll join me in calling for the Iranian authorities to grant Nazreen Suteda an immediate and unconditional release. Thank you. So now we'll turn to a conversation moderated by New York Times columnist Nicholas Kristof. I'm personally thrilled that Nick is here as it was his columns that inspired me to travel to Iran 16 years ago and see the country firsthand. Joining him will be the Iranian artist and activist Parastu Forhuhar, human rights advocate Kerry Kennedy, and Nazreen filmmakers Jeff Kaufman and Marsha Ross. Following the discussion, we should have time for some moderated questions from the audience. Please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen to pose a question to either a specific panelist or over to the group. Thank you and so much. Um, and over to you, Nick, it's all yours for the discussion. Thank you so much, Karen, and uh, and thank you to Margaret Atwood for that uh, earlier introduction. Um, let me start by just sort of explaining why I'm doing this um, and probably why we're all here. And you know, I think part of it is the our deep admiration for Nasreen. Um, she's been compared to Mandela, the Mandela of Iran, and simply as a matter of social justice when a Mandela anywhere is imprisoned, then I think there's a moral obligation on the world to try to free her. But also more broadly, um, look, there are many political prisoners in Iran and Iran has been in many ways isolated from world society. How can we begin to change the discourse in Iran? How can we begin to bring Iran uh, and other countries together? Obviously, there are a lot of levers that have to be addressed. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of issues at, at, on both sides of that gulf. But part of the answer is gonna to be to try to strengthen civil society in Iran. And Nasreen is kind of a thermometer for the well-being of civil society in that country. And uh, somebody who has inspired me, I think, inspires all of us. And the reasons are evident in uh, in in this documentary that we are that is the basis for our discussion today. Um, 
Paris, do let me maybe begin with you. Um, you spoke to Nasreen uh, just as she was being sent back to prison. She's been through this roller coaster of prison, freedom, prison, freedom. And um, so can you tell us a little bit about how she's doing, what she said? I think you're muted too. Yes. Now, <laughs> yes, I can. Um, hello to everybody. I'm happy to be here and talk about Nasreen. Um, yes, it was exactly at the day that uh, she went back to prison. I had called her a uh, couple of days before because uh, we, a small group of uh, Iranian, German Iranians in diaspora, wanted to have a press conference for the Human Rights Day in Germany, in Berlin. And I uh, was commissioned from the group to ask her to send us some kind of a message for this very special day. And she wanted to think about it, but uh, she called me to tell me that uh, prosecutors had uh, called several times, increasingly getting angry with her and asking her to get, go back to prison at the same day. Um, and she was as always uh, calm and determined and she said that she would go back because she didn't want the police to uh, to come to her home in this pandemic time. She wanted to uh, somehow not danger uh, her family. So she had decided to go back to prison. Um, but, uh, you know, there was some kind of a trace of sadness in her voice as she was saying that uh, because she felt very sorrow, uh, she couldn't have seen enough of her children. As she was released, uh, she was tested positive with COVID-19 and she had spent uh, the whole time isolated in a room in her flat and couldn't really have enough of her children. And that was a, a, a moment of sorrow in her uh, voice that I could feel. But uh, at the same time, you know, uh, saying goodbye for an uncertain time, she uh, emphasized that we have to mobilize all of the power for another political prisoner a scientist, Dr. Jalali, who is confronting uh, a death sentence uh, sitting in Iranian uh, prison. And the Iranian authorities actually want to force her exchange, his exchange with, uh, with one of their terrorists who was uh, uh, arrested in Europe. So, she was actually mobilizing for, again, for other political prisoners. And that is the way she is. She, she, she doesn't say anything about herself only. She is advocate for, for the others. So let me uh, ask a little bit about that. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's kind of what is iconic about Nasreen, that here she is um, about to get tossed back in prison. She's wrestling with COVID. And meanwhile, she's trying to galvanize people to worry about another political prisoner. Um, yeah. But I think to a lot of us, she's this, you know, sort of distant icon, but we don't, we don't know her. So what is she, what is she like? What, what motivates her to put up with so much uh, suffering for the sake of these higher causes? Actually, I can just recommend the film that uh, Jeff and Marsha had made because uh, in this film you go with Nasri through his her everyday life. Uh, you can follow her in the streets of Tehran. Uh, you can follow her when she uh, drives to another city to get to a, a client and be with them uh, and you know, this everyday life of this woman shows that 
she's not actually she doesn't want to be a hero she just wants to be a good human being she just wants to be a good mother a good woman and a good lawyer and she wants to do all of these things with heart and uh, honesty and that is her motivation because she wants to be a good mother she can she must think of other children in iran too because she is an honest person she has to be a good lawyer for everybody else too so i think uh, she's actually a face a good face for many many people in iran who are fighting for democracy and for their rights trying to push back a regime that is not uh, just, is not letting them to grow and just uh, trying to, to gain their rights. You mentioned the documentary um, and I encourage people to, you can see the, the trailer for it on YouTube um, and uh, it's also available uh, the, the full documentary in uh, virtual screenings um, at your theater. But Marsha and Jeff, um, maybe tell us how it is that this film came to be made. Uh, you're on mute. Uh, there we go. Try yeah, again. There we go. Sorry about that. Um, that's why I don't push the buttons on the camera. I let someone else do it. Um, I've done a number of other films about human rights, and human rights has always been something very important to me. And I've done a number of films about Iran, and each film about Iran, even though it was critical of the government, gave me a deeper and deeper respect for the Iranian people and the Iranian culture and this interest in exploring and getting to know it better. Um, I have to say that there's something about Nazreen that reminds me of uh, meeting John Lewis several times. Uh, in that, you know, some people who uh, are amazing on the global level aren't so good personally. And there's something marvelous about Nazarene personally, just like John Lewis. And they also share something else. John Lewis had his struggle and he, for civil rights, and he realized that it connected him to a universal struggle for women's rights, for LGBTQ rights, that we're all in this together. And Nazarene very much has that global view that um, all rights for one group are rights for everybody. So we reached out to her in 2016, uh, asked her if we could do this film. Uh, we shared a, a mutual view that it would be uh, also a vehicle to uh, explore a community of activists in Iran and Iranian culture through her life. And uh, thank goodness she said yes. Can and I hear too, I think that Parastu really touched upon that, that big question you have about why, how does she do this? Because I think for me as a mother myself, you know, I had that question too. You know, how could, you know, leaving my children at home. I mean, fortunately, Reza and their family are, are remarkable people and they have a great support system, but she is doing it for not just her children, but other people's children. She really believes in what she's doing, that she needs to do this to make a difference for the future of the lives of Nima and Merava and all the children of Iran and the people, the young women that she represents. And it's just, it's a calling that she has. And I do not think that she sees it as a sacrifice. She sees it as something that just must be done. Can I add one little thing to that, which is that a, a quote I love from Nazarene that connects to it, both Marsha and Paris are talking about, is our children must not inherit silence from us. And it's not a coincidence that we made this film during the Trump era, when we saw our rights, uh, women's rights, civil rights being uh, uh, kicked back over and over and over again, and too many people being silent. And so as much as this is a film about Iran, it's also a film about the importance of uh, fighting for your rights in every country and sort of setting a moral standard for this country at the same time. And also maybe a, a way of telling a story about complexity. Um, you know, that uh, Nasreen is a, her story is a very complicated one and as is that of Iranian women. And, you know, it always strikes me that in some courts in Iran that a woman's testimony is only gonna be half of that of a man and yet the judge can be a woman. And, um, you know, it's, uh, it's and, 
how, I mean, there obviously have been changes in progress, uh, Marsha and Jeff, since 1979. Do you, how, but, but obviously not nearly enough and how, and it's felt like there's some backtracking in recent years. So how, how does Nasreen see that? Is she kind of hopeful that Iran is gonna become more open, more tolerant, more pluralistic, have more room for people like her? Uh, hope is the essential component to keep going, isn't it? You know, um, and, and Nazarene does have amazing uh, reserves of hope. I think there are times when, and Paris too would know this the best as a close friend, there are times when it seems more bleak. Uh, there is something remarkable uh, about the women's rights movement in Iran that goes back over a century and over and over and over again fighting for their rights. Like when Iran's constitution was written in 1903, I think it was, you know, they up until the edge of that constitution, they had their full rights uh, in, in, in word, and then it was removed at the last moment. Uh, and, um, but we, we see um, rights in this country and other countries move forward and push back, democracy move forward and push back. Uh, but ultimately, uh, she has this depth of resilience. But also, I have to say that Nazreen and her husband Reza have said that they get some element of strength from global support and knowing that they're not alone and they're not isolated. And so it's important that we all share that uh, connection together and everyone who's watching that um, your act actions, your activity, your support can actually give strength to someone in very difficult circumstances. Additionally, I, you know, as you see in the film with Nargis Husseini, a lot of young women are really inspired by Nazarene. And even though they see the consequences of what's happened to her, they're still willing to go forward. And I think that's that's very, very important. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, critical mass in terms of people being unwilling to tolerate what's going on anymore really makes a difference in every society. People just, you know, there is no other choice but to go forward. And, uh, and I, I, one other thing too, I, there are a lot of really amazing people. It was really important for us to show life in Iran, you know, in a complex way, you know, um, you know, that it's a city, it's a beautiful modern city with a vibrant arts culture, and that people are out there protesting, sometimes not always getting arrested. And you can see sometimes the same faces over and over again in these crowds. There are many people there really committed to trying to make a difference, even at the same time knowing these incredible risks, but they inspire each other and they support each other. Um. Terry, um, Jeff had mentioned the importance of hope. And well, you're in the hope business. Um, uh, <laughs> you're in the ripple of hope business in the words of your, your dad, Robert Kennedy. Um, but you're also in the hope business worldwide. I mean, you're dealing with human rights issues all over the globe. You're dealing with them within the US. Um, why is it that you've taken on this one? You and Gloria Steinem wrote a terrific op-ed about Nasreen. What is it about her case that has led you to address it in particular? You know, thanks, Nick, and thanks everybody for, for being here today. I think um, uh, it was mentioned earlier that she's the Mandela of Iran, but I really think she's more of, of the Thurgood Marshall. Um, she's a lawyer. She's taking on the toughest human rights cases. She's taking on the cases that other lawyers are um, hesitant to pick up because when they do so, they're putting their own lives at risk. Um, and she's on the cutting edge, constantly um, uh, pushing the regime. Um, so she is a person who gives who wins sometimes, who gives us all hope all the time because she never gives up and she speaks her truth to power. And in doing so, she gives other people their own sense of confidence and their voice to speak truth to power, whether it's in Iran or uh, in Minneapolis um, or anywhere in the world that all of us can use the gifts that we've been given to to serve our country, to serve the world in peace and justice. And, and that's what she's really all about. Um, and 
you mentioned Minneapolis. Um, Carrie, I'm sure that there are some folks who will watch and who will say, oh, you know, those Americans, there they go again. They're, you know, they want to be the policemen of the world. They, they have, you know, their own problems in Minneapolis and every city in the country. Uh, they go around uh, messing in Iran in 1953 and, you know, doing, creating all kinds of mischief all over the globe. What right do they have to talk about a uh, imprisoned lawyer in Iran? Yeah. What do, you, well, what, do you, what do you say to them? Well, I say to them, um, you're right. We have caused a lot of mischief and you're right. We have a lot of issues to face in our own country. And then I would say, and please come, come and point them out, come and join us in that struggle. Uh, and I've also clarified, we don't want to be the police of the world. We want to stop the policing. Um, and uh, work on on being the 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 advocates for justice and the advocates for peace and the advocates for democracy, um, for freedom of expression, which Pan America that is which is um, hosting us all today has been so extraordinary about, and uh, that's that's who we want to be. But no country is perfect. All countries have abuse human rights. Um, it's not just countries, it's also corporations. So it's up to us, um, those who have the freedom to speak out, to do so. And um, even those who don't have the freedom to speak out, Nazreen, one of them, continues to speak out. So surely if she can do that, all of us have a role we can play. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it, that if she can speak out for the human rights of others when she faces such peril in doing so, then you know surely we who face no risk can um, can can step up uh, for her and for others. Uh, and you know, Nick, I would add to that. Think about the issues she's focused on: um, the death penalty for children under eighteen. That's an issue in Iran. It's an issue in the United States. Surely, if she can do that here, we can do. If she can do it there, and face imprisonment and torture and death for doing so, surely we can raise our own hands here, our own voices, and saying and say we need a change. Um, Parastu, um, the. Um, you're such a valuable resource because you, you know, you really, you know her, you knew her parents, um, um, you know her and with kind of a richness that, that, uh, that, that I don't anyway. Um, can you just shape her in human terms? Tell us a story about, uh, about Nasreen that maybe illuminates a little bit about, about yeah. her, about what drives her, uh, you know, mm. whether this whole Mandela of Iran thing is uh, you know is true whether that whether that's justified? Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah. Let me begin with that something. You know, uh, it is now about two decades that I know Nasreen. Uh, the first time I met her, you know, I come from a dissident family. My parents, who have been uh, fighting for democracy in Iran for years and years, has been killed in their own home, in the home that I have been brought up, uh, um, 1998. And uh, I think it was two years after, as I went to Iran, Nasrin came to visit me because my parents' home has become a place of memory, a place to remember the fight for democracy. So many people show up when I um, when I am in Iran, uh, she came with a picture, with a picture from her and my mother together. And she told me that she had interviewed my mother uh, about three years before my mother was assassinated. And uh, she was trying to publish the interview that she couldn't have published at, at that time. It was before that uh, she uh, uh, got her license as a lawyer. 
Uh, so that was the beginning of our relationship, which became more and more uh, uh, to a deep friendship, actually. And she, I have got this picture. It is framed and it's hang on my parents' house. So that that's, that picture also is it's very precious uh, uh, to me because it shows that generations of women in Iran stand for their rights. They they fight for democracy in Iran, and uh, and they they give hope to each other. And then uh, you know we had cooperated, for example, uh, with uh, another friend of us who is also. Uh, we can see her in uh, 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 Jeff and Marsha's film Mansure together to, we wanted together in a small group of women, we have been thinking of establishing a um, women museum in Tehran. And then uh, Mansure was arrested and had to leave Iran and somehow uh, the idea of women museum came uh, out and it has become a, a project for Iranian diaspora but uh, it's still uh, we kept the dialogue with the Iranian the part in Iran with Nasrin most of all and then uh, 2009 as I went to Iran, sometimes when I go to Iran, I become travel ban. And uh, 2009, it was so. And the first person who called me after it was, uh, I, I came back and I couldn't leave the country. I came back from the airport was Nasrin telling me, I would be your lawyer. So she became my lawyer too. So that is the kind of relationship that um, grows uh, in such situations that you, there is a, a support, supporting and uh, standing for each other and trying to, uh, trying to keep this relationship uh, alive in many different levels. It is not also always about uh, fighting. It is sometimes about laughing together, drinking, drinking tea together, having, having chat and uh, uh, going to theater together. When the last time, uh, not last year, the year before she was uh, not in prison, as I visited Iran and then she called me, told me, um, I have got uh, free tickets for a premiere. Uh, don't you want to join me? And then we went together to this theater and it is nice to see how the people really appreciate her presence too, because they, uh, they you know, there is a disrespect that the, the people know she's fighting for them and uh, uh, they, they like her, they like the way she is doing that. So I can go, go on uh, saying such stories. <laughs> um, well, uh, Marcia and Jeff, since we've been talking about the documentary, but can you tell us a little bit, so how do people who are watching this conversation, so how do people see it? Well, right now the film is actually in cinemas across the country. It's in virtual cinema because obviously due to COVID movie theaters aren't open. But if you go to our website, uh, nazarenefilm.com, uh, we have lots of links that will take you to the box offices. And essentially what you do is you, your ticket is actually a stream and you purchase it and you can watch it at home. And then next year the film will be available, you know, on Amazon and iTunes and all those other places a little bit later. So that's, that's what's happening right now. We've also been having a, a really fabulous uh, international uh, impact campaign. We work with a wonderful company called Mocha Media, who's helped us tremendously bring the film to institutions and organizations and groups and schools in many countries around the world already. So there's lots of ways to see the film. Um, Carrie, um, uh, you uh, have plenty of ties with the incoming administration. Um, and Iran is certainly going to be high up on the agenda for the Biden administration. But really, you know, 
in many ways because of the context of the nuclear issue. And I'm sure there are gonna be some people who will say, look, don't mess around with these women's issues or these human rights issues because we've got to solve this nuclear crisis and avoid a war. So what do you, what do you say to them? How, what's the answer to that argument about you know, that, that these issues are secondary? Yeah, I don't think we solve any of these issues uh, in isolation. I don't think we solve uh, nuclear proliferation unless we are working on women's rights. And we don't serve that unless we stop the death penalty. And we don't stop the death penalty unless we're working on rights to education and all of the sustainable development goals. Um, and we don't serve the climate unless we're working on all of these things at the same time as well. So, um, you know, the international, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights uh, is universal. And um, there's no one right that's more important than any of the others because there's this recognition that all of them depend on each other and um, have to be taken as a whole. So we need to work on everything all at once and we can do it. We've got, we've got big shoulders, we've got lots of hands, we've got many people, but I think what's most important uh, is the people of Iran. You know, uh, as the film points out, there are, the women are more educated than men in Iran, which is pretty extraordinary. Um, but Iran, is one of the most pro-democracy, pro-freedom countries on earth. And there's just this extraordinary depth of, um, of interest in uh, education about intellectual depth on the, all of our basic American values with our universal values. So, our greatest ally is going to be finding those people led by Nasreen in Iran and working with them. Can I add one thing to that? I'm sorry, just to yeah, say, go ahead. I'm so sorry, but just to say, um, I agree with everything that Carrie said, uh, but there are those uh, in several countries who think, oh, we're going to impose some sort of regime in Iran that's friendly to us by bombing Iran. And we have to stop that, that rhetoric because, A, the idea of it is abhorrent and will destroy much of the world, but even the rhetoric and the, in, and the intent behind it is destructive. So uh, change has to come internally. There are external ways to support that change, but bombing Iran, attacking Iran uh, is, is not going to, uh, is, is going to destroy uh, moderates and the human rights movement in Iran. It's not going to support it. Yeah, you know, I, I just to chime in myself, I, I think that's exactly right. And I, I really agree with Carrie's point also about the uh, the force for change being the population and being civil society. And it does strike me, you know, as somebody who spent way too much of my time since 9-11 in Afghanistan and Iraq, that in trying to address security challenges around the world since 9-11, we invested overwhelmingly in the military toolbox. And, mm -hmm. you know, look, the military toolbox can do things that other toolboxes can't. But you look almost 20 years later, and it's also pretty clear that that toolbox is incredibly expensive, hasn't achieved nearly what we would like, and regularly creates a backlash uh, that empowers um, others. And in fact, we underinvested, I think, in that civil society toolbox, in the education toolbox, in the women's rights toolbox. And I think that um, if we take a long view, then how can Iran become a more constructive member of the international community down the road? It's gonna be because lawyers, journalists, writers, mm. academics, all kinds of people in Iran are playing more of a role in the society. And uh, that one way of helping achieve that outcome, which is good for Iranians and good for Americans, is if people like Nasreen are are uh, at home with their kids and not in prison. Uh, so um, I'm 
great minds think alike. We all, uh, we we uh, kind of share this. Um, um, Paris, too, can you just tell us a little bit about you know what? So what Nasreen? What is she facing in terms of how long is she likely to be in prison? What the conditions are? She was moved uh, from Evan prison. What? What? So tell us a little bit about her current circumstances, if you will. Yeah, uh, she's now in Garchak uh, uh, prison, which is uh, actually a prison without, uh, in a very bad condition. Uh, and uh, she needs um, medical care. That is the that was the reason uh, why she had this leave, and which was interrupted. And now we have actually to push that for that uh, she becomes again this medical re uh, relief for from the prison because uh, you know she had had um, long periods of hunger strike which has somehow affected her heart and she needs medical care and that is the situation that and that is also one of the big reasons that we have to push uh, and try to uh, get her out of this uh, horrible prison <laughs> as a uh, uh, so much that we can. So that is the situation of her. But um, now uh, sitting in a pen uh, panel, let me say that just uh, the day uh, Nasrin came, uh, went back to prison the day after that, there was a, a open letter from um, uh, um, 36 prisoners from the men uh, section of Evin prison being published. That was an open letter. And the, uh, in this letter, they were um, demanding the um, unconditional leave for the political prisoners, um, talking about the uh, emergency situation in the prisons. And among these people were three writers, three famous writers of Iran, three members of Iranian pen who are sitting now in uh, pre Evin prison in Iran. So I thought that is also a good place to say that uh, 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 it is not only about Nasreen. When we talk about Nasreen, we are talking about a, a prominent, a wonderful, courageous face of the Iranian movement for democracy and human rights. And uh, uh, so uh, as she always uh, herself points out that it is about all of the Iranian political prisoners, about the uh, human rights defenders, about many lawyers who are sitting in uh, prison because they were just doing their job. So let us see her as one face for movement uh, that is very vibrant, very uh, active and needs support. As Carrie was saying, you know, that is this uh, transnational uh, networks, uh, this transnational movements for is now really needed for the Iranian uh, uh, society, for the people demanding democracy, because without this support and uh, um, without the support of the of this these kind of networks, they will not be able to push back this regime, which which is. Uh, the only answer they, that they have is just violence and more violence. So this kind of solidarity and support is really uh, very much needed. Um, we have some questions coming in. So let me spend the next uh, you know, 10 minutes or so um, relaying some of these. Um, uh, David Hoffman says, do you feel the film? And let me 
uh, maybe Marsha and Jeff are best place to, as a, to address this. Do you feel the film, uh, together with all of the international pressure that has been mounting, will ultimately gain Nasreen's release? Uh, are there some small concrete signs moving in that direction? And uh, actually, if I can just you know say initially that I spent much of my career covering repressive regimes that unpredictably suddenly uh, were no longer so repressive uh, from you know, Eastern Europe, South Korea, Mongolia, Indonesia. Um, and it's an imperfect process. But one of the things you also see is that it's, it's, it, it, it doesn't follow a straight line and change is impossible until the moment it actually happens. And I think that's gonna happen uh, with Iran, but, but Marsha and Jeff, how, how do you see this? And you know, to what extent can the film play a role in actually seeing her freedom? Nick, I'd love to know your take on whether you feel that outside pressure uh, and moral suasion can make a difference in those regimes. Uh, but just to say that um, uh, there's been this really inspiring global movement calling for Nazarene's release. And as Peristu says, Nazarene really represents so many other political prisoners, both in Iran and around the world. And um, it's been said to us that that has given Nazarene some cloak of protection. It has to stay constant. It has to keep going. Uh, and, um, you know, we, we can't lower our voices, but that is part of the process of, of protecting her and, and bringing her out. If you look at other political prisoners who uh, have escaped their torment, it's often because the world kept looking at them. Uh, and I just want to say one more, one other thing, which is that uh, we've all mentioned uh, Penn's uh, uh, essential efforts on behalf of Nazreen and for this conversation. I also just want to acknowledge the fact that Ms. Magazine is the, also the co-host of this event. And I've been so moved by their coverage of Afghanistan, uh, Nazreen and Iran. They again make the point that women's rights uh, in one country, women's rights in every country, and women's rights really means everyone's rights. And so we want to thank both of them. But, you know, if you, Nick, if you want to comment on that question, I'd love to know what you think. Um, yeah, I, um, you know, I'm, I'm an optimist on that front. I think that when countries get more of a middle class, when they become more educated, when women become more empowered, then it raises the cost of repression. And, you know, that, that can still happen, but it uh, creates pressures that build. And we've seen that. And I think that we will see that um, in Iran. And, and to those who who make the point correctly, and Nasreen makes it that you know there are many political prisoners, and so why you know why focus on one? There's sort of a lesson perhaps from the South African experience under apartheid. The original slogan that outsiders used was "Free South African political prisoners," and it got nowhere. And then somebody thought, well, let's try "Free Mandela." And once you personified it with one person, then that made all the difference. And it's not that free Mandela was just about freeing Nelson Mandela and then, and then the struggle ends. No, but in the same way that Nasreen uh, is a symbol of the aspirations of so many other people for a more equitable and more democratic and more human rights oriented society. And, um, I, and I hope that, that um, the parallel with Mandela uh, does, uh, does hold. Um, Kerry, we have a couple of questions about, uh, about what leverage outsiders can do. What, you know, people who are moved, they're watching this, they want to help Nasreen, so what do they do? Um, Jala asks, is there a template to use as a resolution for our local cities uh, to support Nasreen and other political prisoners in Iran? And how can we push the Biden administration to include human rights in their negotiations with the Islamic Republic? So I love those questions. So absolutely, there are ways to get city councils to, to weigh in and make resolutions. And all of that is really helpful. You know, you always have to ask the, the person in question, do you think, do you want the, the international spotlight? Nazreen has clearly said yes. So now it's our duty just to give her as much support as possible. So um, as Jeff was saying, we have to keep that up. And uh, city council resolutions is one way to do that. 
also joining Amnesty International and um, their work on Nazreen's case. Uh, watch this film and show it to others, get it into schools, get other people to, to watch it and to understand who she is and what she's doing. And then I think, as I was saying earlier, that um, going back to finding our allies within Iran itself, I think for too many Americans, they know really two things about Iran. One is uh, that there were hostages taken in the 1980s or the late 70s, 79, and two, that there's a nuclear problem. And, and that's it. Um, and they don't know how complex that society is, how rich the history is, um, what Persia meant to the world, uh, and um, the incredible, incredible people who are in Iran. So when its leaders come to the United States, they're just bombarded with uh, questions about the US relationship between them instead of being asked the questions that would be most helpful in gaining um, a civil society action against them, which is why is it you're spending all this money on nuclear weapons when my child is not able to go to school? Um, why don't, why isn't, why are people hungry in this rich and extraordinary country? What are you doing on healthcare? You know, those types of issues that really hold the government accountable, um, not for the big international uh, uh, fighting against the United States Satan, but actually the way people live in their countries and the things that make them mad the same way they make people mad in this country. I hope that helps. Yeah. Can, can I also add also that uh, actually on our website, we have a link to the pen petition, which we hope people will go there and sign it. But we also have many other links to organizations like Amnesty and the other groups that have supported the film and also support human rights in this country and around the world. And they're click through links. So if you want to get involved, you know, you can go right there. It's all on one page. And additionally, for people that are watching that, if you'd like to host a screening through organization and, and have a dialogue and a conversation and learn more about what you can do, you can also go to the website and request that too. And for those who think that, you know, it's just sort of impossible to bring about change, um, you know, a any American who travels Iran is just <laughs> embraced with this warmth from so many ordinary Iranians. And yeah, I mean, is there resentment at some of the sanctions? Absolutely. Is there resentment at some of the history? Absolutely. Um, are there profound disagreements, especially among conservative rural areas? Absolutely. But the, you know, but the warmth of the response that people feel is just, is, is really something that is, is kind of unimaginable until you travel around uh, the country. And, um, you know, I, I I remember I used to visit uh, Kim Dae Jung, the South Korean dissident, uh, in his home in the in the late '80s, and um, you know he he was under house arrest. Uh, the re government was incredibly strong. It was hard to imagine this would ever change, and then it changed in a dime, and he became president. And um, I and one of the I, I interviewed a secret policeman who'd been in one of the homes uh, right next to Kim Dae-jung and his job was to go through Kim Dae-jung's garbage to look for signs of treachery. And so he would read first drafts of Kim Dae-jung's essays and reading these, he gradually became convinced that <laughs> Kim Dae-jung was really a great man, became convinced of democracy. And you know, I think that Nasreen is hard, we can't see that now because the veil is across the country, but I think that that, that, that is happening in Iran. And uh, I, I think, the your your film is prophetic of that change um and uh i think it'll be an amazing sequel after <laughs> after she is free and uh you know uh and and honored the way she should be um we, we're almost out of time but maybe just very quickly um uh uh paris Su suchitra asks if we, she, we can just hear an example of a legal case that nasreen uh pursued uh, as an example of her legal achievements 
can you uh, give a, a just very quickly an example in a minute or so? Mm, uh, for example, uh, she one of the scenes that also I think in the film you can see is uh, how she fights for uh, uh, the Shirin Ebadi's uh, uh, case, who is uh, Nobel Peace uh, uh, um, owner of in um, and very respected woman in uh, Iranian society, and uh, uh, she lives now in exile. And Nasrin uh, was her lawyer, and uh, you see how she really uh, respond uh, to one of uh, the figures in Iran who is really everybody is uh, frightened of this man in the court. Is one of the most horrible hardliners of Iran. Uh, and responsible for many, many really horrible things. And she just uh, uh, stand up and um, uh, without any fear, talk to him uh, and says, uh, he has not, the, what he's saying here is a law, lie. So that is, uh, that is how, that was for, for uh, one example about, but of course uh, the other very prominent uh, or a very famous uh, uh, thing is uh, that she tried to, um, she was the lawyer of the young women who uh, took their scarf away and uh, um, had uh, protested against the contemporary uh, hijab and uh, mm, they were all arrested and she uh, uh, became their lawyer. So um, there are many of them actually. <laughs> well, yes. Um, she no, inspires nice. us and uh, the film inspires us. Uh, uh, you all inspire us. Carrie, your work inspires us. Um, and uh, I just want to give a, I'm going to hand things over to Karen, but I just want to also just give a shout out to, uh, to Pan and to Ms. Magazine for um, highlighting this issue, you know, at a time when so many people are looking inward and we're worried about COVID and this and that. The last thing we want to do is spend another moment on, on Zoom, but um, this is a very special person. It's a very special time in history. And I think we really do have leverage where we can uh, make some difference. So thanks to all of you for uh, joining this effort. And Karen, over to you. Thank you so much to Nick and to our wonderful panel um, for such an enriching and inspiring discussion. It's been such a pleasure having you all take part in this event on behalf of, of Nazreen today. Um, to close the event, we have a special video message from Reza Khandan, who is Nazreen's husband, um, direct from Tehran. So um, we're gonna run the video right now and then I'll, I'll do a final closing. But thank you to all of you for joining us. <laughs> از توجه و حمایت شما و همه کسانی که در این مدت از نسرین و خانواده ما حمایت کردند از صمیم قلب سپاسگزارم سازمان های حقوق بشری نویسندگان روزنامه نگاران وکلا سیاستمداران هنرمندان و مردم از سراسر دنیا مراتب مهر و همدلیشان را ابراز کردند و همواره در کنار ما بودند و این شانس بزرگی است که نصیب ما شده است چنانچه این سطح از توجه و آگاهی رسانی و فشار افکار عمومی برای آزادی زندانیان سیاسی وجود نداشت وضعیت آنها به مراتب بدتر و خطرناکتر بود دستگاه قضایی و امنیتی ایران هیچ محدودیتی برای اعمال خشونت در قبال منتقدان برای خود قائل نیست تنها مانع بزرگ آنها رسانه ها و افکار عمومی افکار عمومی و سازمان های حقوق بشری است از طرف خودم و نسرین جا دارد که از جف و مارشا به عنوان کارگردان و تهیه کننده فیلم مستند نسرین و تیم بسیار قوی آنها که توانستند مجموعی از هنرمندان نامی را برای ساختن این فیلم زیبا و تکان دهنده جمع کنند تشکر ویژه داشته باشم این فیلم هدیه است از اولیویا کولمن، لین آرنز، استیون فلاهرتی، آنجلی کیجو، آشر بینگ هام، تایلر استریکلند 
و بسیاری دوستان دیگر نسرین و من توانستیم این فیلم را همراه خانواده من چند هفته پیش با هم ببینیم میخو و مه به تماشای فیلم شدیم دلمان را شاد کرد و شاد و پر از حرارت کرد با اینکه نسرین به زندان قرشک بازگشته است میدانیم که تنها نیستیم به خاطر فیلم صدای ما را میشنوید و ما را میبینید این فیلم در واقع داستان یک شخص یا یک خانواده نیست داستان ایرانی دیگر است ایرانی که کمتر میبینید مردم کشوری را نشان میدهد که مانند مردم بسیاری از کشورها برای یک زندگی شرافتمند توأم با آزادی و ادالت و کرامت انسانی مبارزه می کنند. زیبایی این فیلم و این گرد همایی در به صحنه آوردن انسانیت عمیقی است که ما را به هم وصل می کند. من و نسرین از آقای نیکولاس کریستوف، خانم کری کندی، خانم پرستوف روهر، خانم مارگارت آتوود، خانم کارین کارل کر و آقای امیر سلطانی و تمامی حضار محترم به خاطر دوستی و همبستگیتان متشکریم. از پن و مجله میس برای احترامی که به جف و مارشا میگذارند برای حمایت از این فیلم و برای مهر و لطفی که نسبت به همه ما در ایران دارند متشکرم. رضا خندان 16 دسامبر 2020 Well, thank you, everybody. Um, I can't say it much better than Reza just said it himself. Um, but on, on behalf of myself and Pan America, we would like to thank Reza and Nazarene for their bravery, for everyone involved in organizing this event, um, and to all of you for tuning in. Please watch the Nazarene documentary film. Please sign the Pan America petition, share the word on social media, encourage your friends to watch the film, and continue to stand with all of us in solidarity to help free Nazarene. Thank you very much for joining us today. Um, we will be um, uploading the um, complete video of the event on YouTube after the event. So if you know anyone who would like to watch it and wasn't able to join in, we will have it available and it will also be available on Facebook. So thank you again. And thank you to all the panelists for joining in. It's been a pleasure. <laughs>